Well, sometimes you have guests on the show that you look forward to for many weeks in advance, and today is a great example of that. Uh, inside Patterson Program Support, we've had more than a few people recommend uh, that I get today's guest on the podcast. He's an expert when it comes to the microbiome, probiotics, and everything to do with gut health, and his clinic has been set up to treat people with these kind of uh, intestinal um, disorders. Uh, his name is Dr. Jason Horolak, and he's the head of research at probioticadvisor.com. His passion for gastrointestinal health and the GIT microbiota and probiotics was ignited during the final year of his undergraduate training. And subsequently, Dr. Horolak did his first class honors degree and PhD degrees in the area of the gastrointestinal microbiota, irritable bowel syndrome, and the clinical applications of pre and probiotics. He has written extensively in the medical literature on these topics, including 16 textbook chapters, and his research has been cited over 900 times. So thank you, Dr. Horolak, for joining us today. Ah, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure to be here, Clint. We, this topic is so massive. You know, it's one of these things where you know, I would love to be next to you on an aeroplane between here and Perth and have five hours <laughs> <laughs> to talk about this stuff with and, you. And, and I could speak about it for five hours straight without much gap, definitely. <laughs> and, and in fact, this is uh, how um, your suggestions as a guest has, has come about um, quite frequently is because my clients have attended your seminars and have gained so much out of your seminars where you, where you present on, on this topic. Great. That's lovely to hear, actually. Yeah. Yes. Um, and the feedback has been wonderful and, and they've wanted to, uh, to, to have you uh, share to, to a greater audience. So um, first of all, how did you become so passionate about gut health? Good question. And, and unlike many people, it wasn't because my own personal health issues were gut related. In fact, Mine aren't. My, my cat's one of my strong systems. My, my, lung, my lungs are arguably my weakest system. Um, but, but essentially, I had a lecturer in my final year of my naturopathy uh, training in, in fourth year, gave a lecture around um, you know, increased intestinal permeability and dysbiosis, which were constants widely discussed in, by, by naturopaths you know, probably for 15, 20 years even prior to that, but weren't widely discussed in the, the broader medical community. And the lecture was just inspiring to me of going, you know, this is something I want to delve into more because he was just really talking about the fact that we're just at the tip of the iceberg and and we need to, people to delve in a bit deeper. And I was like, yes, please, yes, please. I put my hand up. I want to be one of those people. So I approached him right afterwards and said, hey, I'm very keen on doing my honors research in this this area. And then that flowed straight onto my my PhD as well. So and it it just was like a perfect match from my perspective in terms of once I started delving into the research, this was like, this is yeah. what I want to do, this is what, what I want to be doing. And and, and you know, just 19 years on, um, 19 years plus on, <laughs> I still find great enjoyment from reading papers on intestinal permeability and and gut microbiota and probiotics and prebiotics and ways we can alter that, that gut ecosystem. And it's just been phenomenal to watch the rise of this field from you know, being much more fringe, you know, going back nearly 20 years ago to now where it's widely talked about by mainstream media, for example, and, and, and on te mainstream television networks having shows talk, talking about it. So it's been amazing to see that sort of meteoric rise over that time period. Yes, I just in the time period that I've been paying attention to such things, uh, I got diagnosed with RA in 2006. And in that year, I, I think I saw a a bunch of different naturopaths and and one of them talked about leaky gut and so forth and and uh, and uh, it was the first sort of you know exposure I had to that concept um, and then as I read you know some scientific papers certainly not the extent that you do but just as a as a layman just reading some of these things I've noticed that it's become more and more uh, uh, acceptable and mentioned in in some of the first tier like the very highest level medical journals yeah. uh, that that is behind autoimmunity. So we've gone beyond the, the fringe, as you said, and into mainstream. Yeah, hugely so. But it, it's still fascinating because you still get patients who, or I still hear sort of uh, some medical competitors brought out on TV occasionally and like, oh, there's no such thing as leaky gut. And I'm like, have you not read papers in the last 20 years? Like, <laughs> you could say that 20 years ago and I could say, yeah, it, it, you'd have to search in the literature to find it. Whereas now with the link between you know, obesity, type 2 diabetes, autoimmune diseases, um, to name just a few, and, and gut increased permeability. The data is it's so there and so widely published that it's, it's hard to see people. Now you see it as putting their heads in the sand and, and trying not to look for information. Um, yeah, because you're right, it's there. And it's there in mainstream journals 
in, in high impact mainstream journals. How do you uh, how do you implement what you've learned over all this all these years uh, into your clinical practice, and how do you help people? Yeah, I mean, it's been um, I can think back of how I practiced, you know, fifteen. <laughs> 18, 19 years ago. And it's like things evolve as, as, as they should. Um, and I uh, suppose for me though, uh, looking after the microbiota, it's, it's always been a core, a core concern, uh, of my practice and looking after, after gut integrity. And I think as research has, has evolved and my clinical, um, experience has, has, um, broadened and I've gotten a lot more experience, obviously as time progresses and, and technology that we have access to as clinicians has, has, has evolved as well has meant that the way we treat now is, is somewhat different than before. But, you know, I still see the maintenance of good gut integrity as being pivotal to good health. And I see the maintenance of a healthy microbiome as being pivotal to good health. And I think what's, what's really changed is we just have more data on how to achieve that now, um, particularly in the, in the realms of microbiota um, alteration. And, and, and importantly, we have, my, I myself as a clinician, have access to tools to assess the microbiota in much greater detail than I would have 10 or 15 years ago. Um, we, the tools that we had were far more crude. And, you know, we would do a stool analysis that would tell you about like six different gut species, six out of the 160 or something you might have. Yeah. It's like, that, but that was the best we had access to back in the day. Um, Whereas now we have have tests that can tell us about the entire you know bacterial composition of that ecosystem, and and there, are, I mean, many of those species we actually don't know what they do, um, because they've just recently been discovered, and we can say, hey, these things exist. We didn't know they existed before because mm-hmm. our technology has improved. It's going to take another ten years before we tease out what some of them do, or fifteen years. Yeah. You know? So I think it's, it's whilst we've come a long way, there's still a long way to go. Sure, um, but because we do have a greater capacity to look at that ecosystem now, it means that we can. Um, researchers can see the impact of interventions from a dietary perspective, lifestyle perspective, you know, prebiotics, probiotics, et cetera, on that ecosystem, and even things like herbal medicines. Um, and then also as a clinician, <clears throat> I, I can see firsthand, you know, after treating, you know, hundreds of patients looking at microbiota pre and post, you start seeing patterns and you start seeing what works well, what's been brought from the, you know, clinical trial realm into the clinical practice realm successfully, and what things don't <laughs> mm-hmm. translate that well. And are the are the tests though are the sort of the uh, the samples still stools that are being used, and it's just the way those stools are being interpreted that provides the more detailed information. Yeah, yeah. The old technology yeah. that essentially went from the you know late eighteen hundreds to late nineteen hundreds was was culturing, where you would you know, take the poo sample and you'd spread it into a petri dish with some growth media, and you would look to see what would grow. Oh, right. That's essentially, it, and you try growing it in different types of media yeah. and different environments, some with oxygen, some without. And then and, and from and then we'd expose it to different chemicals and we would see what it looked like, what it smelled like, what it did. And then you could classify it as a sort as a spe- like a bacteroides or an E. coli or something along, you know, some sort of species based on those characteristics. It was a very time consuming process for one, but but most importantly, um, from probably the early two thousand onwards, we realized quite clearly that 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 technique was insufficient to see most of what was there. And, and and because and and some research came out suggesting that maybe maybe we can culture thirty percent of the species that are present in someone's gut, at most thirty percent. So that meant we were missing it. And some some people argue it's even ninety percent of what people or, or what species are present in people's guts we couldn't actually grow um, using that old technology. So when we started shifting to using um, a technique called sixteen S R R N A essentially using a bit a fragment of DNA that all bacteria share, but it's unique to that that genus. So all bacteroides will have a different barcode to bifidobacteria, which have a different barcode to Escherichia, for example. Um, and we just looked at the the amount of that barcode in someone's stool, and we could work out, okay, well, bacteroides makes up 30% of that mm-hmm. person's ecosystem, bifidobacteria 15%. And then we also see that there's a whole bunch of barcodes that match no known <laughs> Species that we've been able to grow before. So some of them, some of these have been named, some haven't been named, but um, we're still teasing out what characteristics they have and what roles they play hmm. in the gut. But it was that change of technology that allowed us to really see what was going on in much greater depth because previous studies, and I can think of a, a study in, in rheumatoid arthritis specifically that I think illustrate this well. And and you probably were familiar with the research that was using, you know, fasting and raw food vegan diets for for improvement of, of RA. And I think it was in the early 2000s, some of the research teams up in the Nordic nations where this was a common sort of, well, somewhat common <laughs> way of, of uh, treating RA, um, decided to look, hey, maybe they're just changing the microbiota 
you know, so let's let's look. And they'd use culturing, and they couldn't see a difference from from taking people from a typical Western diet to like you know raw food, vegan with lots of fermented foods. <laughs> and they said, "Wow, we can't actually see a difference here We're using the the this traditional techniques of culturing." Um, but they did a novel technique, which was looking at uh, I think it was fatty acid profile in the, the bacterial well. And they and f- with that technique, they said there was massive differences between mm-hmm. them. And they essentially said that this this dietary approach completely changed these people's quality of life and and, and symptom profiles, etc. And it looks like a change changes the ecosystem but not with the techniques that we can that are commonly used we need to develop new techniques to see what was there and that's really what rolled out from the early 2000s and now we know that those sort of dietary approaches um, can make a dramatic shift in someone's ecosystem and that the data from the 1960s and 70s looking at dietary interventions and impact on the microbiota was just too too crude the tools we were using to actually make and see what was going on Mm. Well, that's, uh, you know, very enlightening that we have these tools now. And um, the challenge that we have as patients uh, is once we go to a clinic such as Ubiome, just to mention one that I've used personally, yes. um, is the interpretation of it. I mean, you get the results and it's just mind blowing. It gives you all of these very difficult to pronounce bacterial strains and it shows you a comparison between what your uh, stool composition looks like to all the other folks who have a healthy uh apparently healthy uh, lifestyle, uh, and it's very hard to interpret what to do with those. So um, in, your, in your yeah. clinic, what do, you, what do you see between a relationship between someone who's, say, has Crohn's disease, um, and, of course, I want everyone to appreciate that when we have a bowel disorder, an intestinal disorder, um, you know, with rheumatoid arthritis, these are the same sort of internal problems that we suffer. So if we learn from Crohn's, we learn from... Uh, other similar uh, health um, challenges, then it can be implemented into a case of rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or so on. So what do you see in terms of the, say, severity of symptoms and the link between people's microbiome? And is there any uh, pattern that's always showing up that you've learnt that is a red flag in terms of their bacterial balance? Ah, I mean, I would think for many conditions, and in my practice is, is very much GIT based. So I see you know, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, IBS, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, um, peptic ulcer disease. I mean, they would see lactic disease, fructose intolerance, lactose, so they would make up the bulk bulk of who mm-hmm. I would see in practice. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, we know from the from the, the what, what I was the, there is some commonalities that I, I think would run through a lot of those, and maybe with the odd exception like celiac. Um, where low levels of, of butyrate producing bacteria is a, is, a, is a pattern that tends to run through those disease states and often high levels of hydrogen sulfide gas producers would be another another group of bacteria that would that, that pattern would run through Crohn's ulcerative colitis um, uh, irritable bowel syndrome mm-hmm. as well for example right okay now if we just try and uh, relate that information onto what most of us appreciate on a on a simple level, which is that we kind of have good bacteria in so yeah. inverted commas and bad bacteria. Um, yep. So, um, uh, and we read on probiotic bottles when we buy them that something is a Lactobacillus acidophilus, acidophilus or a Lactobacillus uh, X, Y, and Z. Um, so, uh, how does that footprint of knowledge match with what you've just said? How, how can we how can we sort well, of correlate that? Not so much, <laughs> it's because the, the probiotics that we have access to are, are generally based on two different genera, Lactobacillus and Bifidobacterium, mm-hmm. um, and that's perhaps a bit of a quirk of fate in terms of what we uh, was isolated, you know, fifty hundred years ago <laughs> from from people's guts and in fermented foods that we sort of stuck with those two genera, um, mm-hmm. despite the fact that they are important but relatively small players in the overall gut ecosystem versus something like your butyrate producing bacteria and, and many people and, and it's a healthy populations make up 40 50 60 percent of what's there yeah whereas mm-hmm. lactobacilli in a healthy person is 0.01 percent of what's there which is fascinating you know? if i may if i may jump in because so many of my clients including myself on one of my ubiome tests showed that i had no lactobacillus and it was quite concerning to those individuals and also raised my own eyebrows so what you're saying is that that's not at all uncommon. 
Well, you're right. It's not. It's not that uncommon. I, I mean, I can say that that clinically, by putting lots of effort back, we can we can generally bring that that in, in majority of patients who have apparently no lactobacillus, supply, we can bring it back with targeted feeding, which is different than trying to supplement your way to to get around it, because there are, are problems with that which we'll probably get a chance to touch with, but touch on. But if we um, focus on on feeding up your indigenous populations by by selectively using the right prebiotics for example, in the right sort of dietary approaches that we can often bring, you know, species that are apparently extinct, like bifidobacter, or genus that are apparently extinct, like lactobacilli or bifidobacteria back up to, to healthy populations, thankfully. But there would be about 20% of patients I, I, see, I can see clinically from my practice where they are truly extinct from that ecosystem. And if they're truly extinct then, before I ask you some of these dietary interventions, uh, which everyone's desperate to hear now, um, is it then possible to restore them without that seed of, you know, like if the earth suddenly got flattened by nuclear warfare and there were no humans left, like how do we then, do we need two humans to then recreate the population? Well, yeah, so that if that person is, is extinct of lactobacilli, for example, that taking a, eating some sauerkraut or kimchi or yogurt or taking a probiotic supplement won't permanently colonize them. I mean, I think we've probably got 40 years of research showing this clearly that in the vast, vast majority of cases, these probiotic strains are very transient visitors. You know, there's the odd exception to that of, you know, one out of 100 studies that show that one particular strain can colonize for a period of time. Most stick around for a few days at best or a couple of weeks at best. And you can see their population diminishes every single day. So they're just temporary there. So that means we can't do it that way. And there's certainly the, the, the capacity potentially re, um, reseeding with a fecal transplant, for example. Um, and there are certainly, you know, these days, the, the rationale for FMTs or fecal microbial transplants have, has increased pretty dramatically from where it was you know, 10 or 15 years ago. And there's a lot more of patients that I see that, that have actually done FMTs these days, too, as a way of trying to restore diversity back to a very damaged ecosystem, as well as to, to treat specific disease states like cluster, cluster DODs, difficile infection. Um, so what if we were to uh, do a combination of eating? Uh, well, you mentioned that the probiotics are transient. So if we, if we take one of these off-the-counter uh, supplements that we can go and buy from our local health food store, and we take this supplement, it's, what you're saying is that we know from the studies that over the period of, say, a week or two, Whatever we took is no longer inside our body. It doesn't yep. colonate. It doesn't stay with us. Exactly. Um, the argument I've heard against that um, just colloquially is that, yes, but it takes up some of the so-called uh, real estate or, or area, therefore helping to minimise the impact of other so-called bad bacteria in that space. Um, that's one question. And the other question, so if you could comment on that and also yeah. comment on whether or not if doing that and supplementing like we, like we do and then adding foods that are rich in prebiotic, which we'll talk about in a sec, um, can that maybe uh, provide the spark and also the fuel for it then to colonise maybe? Yeah, so I'll answer that second question first because it's fresh in my mind. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely idea, and and, people, and they've researched it. It's, the particle is called symbiotics, where you combine the the right probiotic with the right prebiotic, and and there's there's still very good data showing that when we do this, and we know that this uh, lactose uh, cassia uh, shirota, for example, is one particular strain of, of probiotic bacteria that's commonly found in those you you cold milk drinks all around. Yeah, the Japanese yeah. yukult. Yeah, yeah. That's right. So they, they know that this, this particular bug likes eating galactolegosaccharides, which is a type of prebiotic. So they combined the two and said, maybe this will mean it will stay around in the gut yeah. for longer. It didn't. It didn't make any real difference. So, and, and there's a couple other studies showing that it didn't really enhance the, the, um, the duration of time at which they colonized. Now, it doesn't mean, I mean, you can still play with that and, and it's, it may well give it a bit of a boost of population, which is not a bad thing in that very, for that first little bit. And maybe you make it stick around for a little bit longer than, than before, mm -hmm. but it's not enough to make it permanently stick. Mm -hmm. Sadly, I wish it was as simple as that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. That'd be great. Yeah, it would. <laughs> but going back to the original question, I mean, I prescribe probiotics a lot in my clinical practice, but not because they're permanently colonizing their gut. There's, there's a whole wide range of reasons to take probiotics. And when you start looking into the probiotic science more, you realize that they're not just you know, placeholders, that, that some specific strains can release compounds that help heal up a damaged gut. 
you know, that's a that's a great trait to have, and they don't permanently stay there. But whilst you take them, they will have they'll secrete that compound, which is which is helpful for speeding up healing. Others will have a direct anti-inflammatory effect. Others can can bind to um, viral pathogens, for example, and prevent that viral pathogen from causing your your gut damage and getting diarrhea. Great mm-hmm. reason to take it. You know, and and then we have those situations like antibiotics or chemotherapy or radiotherapy where um, you have a pretty – you're taking an agent that causes a pretty great ecological change to that ecosystem in your gut. And there's lots of vacant space, in which case right. when you take a probiotic at that time, they will take up those car – I always use the analogy of the car, car parking lot that when it's full, there's no room for sort of pathogens to grow into or for pathogens to even just to find a parking spot. They just have to go out the other end, go in, no place to park, they go out. Whereas after antibiotics or chemo, you get lots of car – Parking spot become available, and it's easy for those that have survived the 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 onslaught of the chemicals who have resistance to that agent to grow into that space. Um, but it's also possible that you ingest some microbes that normally wouldn't be a problem. But when your ecosystem is that disturbed, there's lots of food and space available for it, and that is a great argument for taking probiotics at at those during those sort of um, interventions, and then certainly afterwards to to help take up the the space and take and compete for food with potential pathogens. Yeah, you know, and uh, certainly use probiotics that way too. Yeah, that's fascinating. I uh, I love that. Uh, I love that uh, car park analogy. I'll um, use that one in the future. Um, yeah. Let's. Um, I'm wondering which way we can go here. I want to talk about foods, of course, and we we can spend some time with that. I also want to explore the actual um, physical mechanics of what this these car parks look like and where these gut bacteria actually live inside the body. Um, so why don't we save the food stuff uh, for a little later? Let's talk about when the let's talk about the mechanics of taking probiotics and their their journey from from our mouth to where they're going to end up. So what does that look like? Yeah, well, well, it's 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 interesting because I think we now know that even like salivary amylase, like our digestive enzymes may actually have the capacity to decrease the growth of some <laughs> probiotic bacteria that we may have ingested. And then, th- so that's the first, you know, um, hurdle they have to overcome. And then we have gastric acid or stomach acid, which is the, probably the biggest hurdle of all. And right. these days, most of the, well, the better probiotic brands or supplements contain strains that can actually tolerate gastric acid. Well, they've been selected on that. They, they've oh. been trialed and tested. Yeah, they can jump that hurdle. They can get survive stomach acid well. So they have that aspect, and they reach the small intestine, and then they have to deal with bile, and they have to deal with mm-hmm. intestinal digestive secretions. And again, some don't tolerate those well. Some, like most yogurt-producing bacteria, for example, explode when they hit, hit the bile in your small intestine. Right. Um, so they don't, they're not alive from that yeah. point. Let's they can't help you in any way. <laughs> <clears throat> but but again, well well thought through and well researched probiotics actually will tolerate those those conditions and then potentially have an interaction with with other components of the microbiota in the small bowel and large bowel or with immune cells in your small and large bowel as well. Um, my my uh, observation of the literature uh, tells me that. Most of our bacteria should be in the colon, um, and we have a sort of a uh, almost a um, small percentage of our bacteria living in the small intestine. Um, first of all, if you could clarify that, and also um, talk about what happens in the case of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and why that's such a bad thing. Yeah, yeah, no, you're you're pretty spot on. That if you look at at you know the bacterial counts in the stomach or you know, 10 to 100 bacteria per mil of fluid because stomach acid is very good at killing microbes in general. And But in the small bowel, you're looking at normal levels are, you know, 1,000 bacteria per mil or less for the first bit of the small bowel. And as we make our way th- down through, I think it's nine meters in length, that small bowel, it's amazing to think it's all wrapped up in your gut. Towards the end of that, it gets up to about 100 million bacteria per mil. And then you've got that eosecal valve, which which separates the small intestine from the large intestine. You hop over, and it's all of a sudden ten to the eleven. You go from right. ten to the eight to ten to the eleven. So it's you know a thousand fold more bacteria per mil of, of contents. So you're right. The, the colonic ecosystem is is far more densely populated and a far wider variety of microbe species present. But you do get people where 
through potentially, you know, can be things like surgery where they've removed that ileocecal valve, for example, or mm -hmm. another common cause would be people taking proton pump inhibitors, the class of medications used to treat reflux disease, where they're essentially stopping the stomach acid from doing its thing, mm -hmm. where the small bowel can be overpopulated by bacteria. Mm -hmm. And then some people having a smaller amount of bugs won't actually make a difference to their quality of life. They won't even notice it. But you'll find other people where, where, and if, particularly if it's in that first small bit of your small bowel, it can se severely disrupt your nutritional status as well because the bacteria are eating your your food before you do. So you can end up with things like iron deficiency, and I'm sure they, they grab zinc as well, but certainly iron is, is well noted. And they will eat things like the fructose and the lactose, and you'll, you'll get very obvious symptoms and or even glucose in that case too. So if you ate like, a, I wouldn't want you to eat it, but if you ate like a Danish pastry or something like that, you would get symptoms like about half an hour afterwards of bloating, distension, increased gas, for example, and potentially pain and diarrhea. Um, and that can happen in the small intestinal bacteria overgrowth from having cherries and mangoes and healthy foods too, because yeah. essentially the bacteria are in that bit of your small intestine where you would normally absorb that that fructose, for example, that's in those other foods, but it's not being absorbed, it's being eaten by the microbes who produce gas, and then you get a range of, of symptoms as a consequence of that. I've got, yeah. definitely got some clients who who suggest that it's they get a lot of bloating and 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 challenges that sounds like SIBO. Um, yep. And is there some just some really simple tests they can do? Is there a a breath test that I, I think I've 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 heard yeah. of? Um, and and what should they do about it? Just a couple of sort of no brainer things that they should do about that. Well, I'm not sure about the no-brainer, actually. It's, it's, a, tr it's a tricky thing. It's, right. It sounds like, well, oh, we'll just deal I'll with be... this bacteria growing in your small bowel. It's like, mm, not that not that straightforward. Right. Um, yeah, I think breath testing is, is, is very helpful to help determine. I mean, you can get some of this data from good questioning as well, surely, about looking at timing of things. Okay, do you, when you eat an apple, do you get symptoms in 20 minutes, 40 minutes versus two hours? You know, two hour, an hour and a half, two hours afterwards, you can say clearly say it's it's colonic or large bowel right. fermentation, whereas before that time, you would argue small bowel. And I think that's a good general rule. But I do think doing breast testing is very worthwhile to, to definitively see what's going on. And for me, I would, I would do, my typical approach would be a triple sugar test where they would do um, they would do glucose. And these would be at separate times, I should point out too. But they would do glucose, they would do fructose, and then they would do lactulose on different days. And essentially after they ingest those sugars, if, you're, if your listeners aren't familiar with the, the technique, but they essentially breathe into these bags every 15 to 20 minutes um, to collect their gas gas levels. And what we're looking for is, is bacterially produced gases. And that would be generally hydrogen or methane currently. And we don't produce hydrogen or methane. Human cells don't, but your gut bacteria do. See. And we're looking at, at whether you produce it and at what time point you produce it. So lactulose, for example, is a good control sugar in that every, nearly everybody will produce hydrogen or methane from taking lactulose. But for most of us, it would be, you need to give it to 50 healthy general people, it would be from the 90-minute mark onwards, whereas yeah. in the colon. But if it happens at the 40-minute mark or 60-minute mark, then you're like, okay, that's small bowel. Yeah. And, and, and certainly with, with fructose, you shouldn't be producing any gas at all. <laughs> For ingestion of fructose or glucose, they should be well absorbed into your system. And if you produce gases, that generally tells you that there's a problem there. Although with fructose, it can be either a small bowel issue where you get this big spike in gases at the you know early minutes. 20 or 40, 60 minutes, for example, or in the more classic uh, case of fructose intolerance, it would actually happen in the colon, um, which wouldn't be SIBO. But if it happens in the early time points, it would be SIBO. And same with glucose. You should always absorb glucose fine. You should not have any increase in gas. But if you get a bit spiked, then you know it's actually bacteria eating it in the small intestine to blame. I love and it. And from that, we get to look at hydrogen, whether you're a hydrogen producer or methane producer. And, and just those two simple things can actually change how we treat. And this is where doing the, the breath testing is versus just basing on symptoms can give us more useful data. And for me, whether you react to la lactulose, fructose, or glucose tells me data that actually impact my prescribing of, of generally herbal antimicrobials as well. So I find I get useful data from that. Okay, beautiful. Um, first of all, I love the... I love the, in some ways, the practical nature of it is that we have a finite period of time that it takes for our food to move from A to B and, uh, and using that as a, um, as a guideline, uh, we're able to find out where on the path the problem is at based on how long yeah. it takes for the, for the, for the gas to come. Um, breathing into this bag, does that bag then get sealed and, and given yep. to your laboratory and then the, the tests are run on the, on the gas? Exactly. So that they will yep. then look for that the, the, the amount of parts per million of hydrogen or methane 
yes. in their hydrogen MD thing in the best best labs um, at those points. And you also want to make sure that they do that at the 15 or 20 minute time marks, mm-hmm. not 30 or 45 minutes. You see some labs that do 60 minute time points and it's just, right. it's just too big of a gap. You can't see what's yeah. going on. You could have a total normal zero, then a rise, and the normal 60 minute, but then at 120, it's a spike up and you're like, well, yeah, what's happening in between? So the, yeah. the the best labs will do fifteen or twenty minute time points, and they will allow you to do those three sugars on on patients and potentially more, but at least those those three. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then you said you treat those with antimicrobials, um, and then um, what sort of uh, uh, expectation of success do you have once you start the patient on those? Yeah, well, it would usually be, for me, a combination of things. So I would use, the, you know, choose the right probiotic to suit the patient in the presentation. I would use the right prebiotic in that situation. And then I would use herbal antimicrobials too. And that would be tailored on whether it's methane or hydrogen dominant um, and whether the, the bugs had, could eat lactulose or not. So I'd fine tune it based based on those. And same with some other, other like prebiotic recommendations might be fine tuned based on the breath test results as well. Now, typically... I suppose I should say there, there's a few ways of approaching SIBO that that there's perhaps there's a harder core, hard, more hardcore ways, which could include an, antibiotics or antibiotic combinations through to more hardcore herbal agents, which, you know, high potency uh, enteric coated essential oils through to what I would what I would see as a next sort of level down of using herbal tinctures that have antimicrobial effects but are less likely to cause collateral damage to the colon ecosystem. So I'm wanting to be as selective and it goes back to what I said before about really caring about that colonic ecosystem and doing my utmost with every intervention I'm prescribing to take into account the health of that ecosystem when I'm prescribing. So I try to choose my herbs to work more selectively, at least for my first few iterations before I pull out the bigger guns in terms of treatment. Um, and generally they work, which is good, but it may take a little bit longer to work than, than you know, taking hardcore uh, essential oils um, that are entirely coated that might work within a couple of weeks. Um, in my experience, we usually start seeing some shifts uh, Sometimes it is within a week or two, which is always great for me and my mm. and the patient. But I can say the median time with my approach is around the four weeks where something the the knob gets turned on. I'm not sure why it takes that long, but but it's pretty consistent. That's the median time. You know, sometimes sooner, but that's the most common. Do you think that? Uh, and now I'm pulling out my big guns of knowledge that there's some quorum sensing going on with regards to um, the shift of the microbiome because. Um, or the shift of what goes on even in the SIBO situation. And uh, for my audience, um, what I'm talking about is uh, there was a study by a lady, I can't remember, but she talked about how it took a certain amount of bacteria, I think, in a sea creature before it shifted from a certain colour to another or something. Anyway, um, I'm, 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 I'm not, not putting together much of a, uh, a factual statement here, but... Uh, the, this this concept of where the bacteria are somewhat aware of their numbers around them, and at some point they can then make a collective decision about a takeover or a re- so forth. Interesting idea, interesting concepts. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm not fully sure, and we're okay. often using, as I said, it's a multi pronged approach where you have a, a prebiotic compound that's nourishing certain species. You've got a um, who then start changing the environment to one that's less conducive to the growth of potential pathogens is often the way I'm looking at it. Yeah. I'm potentially using a probiotic strain that can also have selective antimicrobial activities to reduce levels of bugs we don't want present. And then the herbs are helping that too. And it, whether it's just, it just takes a, a time to get through that resistance. Right. And certainly we know that some of the herbal medicines clearly can 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 degrade biofilm, for example, which is sort of that that protective layer that sort of pathogens may actually have or or the SIBO bugs may actually have in that that sort of gut layer that that will initially protect them from the the um antimicrobial compounds but then as that may slowly get get stripped away over time it then may allow the yeah. herbs to penetrate through and actually kill the the, the bugs at the more, more core aspect of it so that's certainly a, a potential scenario of what's occurring in that 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 explains the time distance yeah. difference okay thank you um now, I have a couple of clients who have been in a state of wellness, and this is not so much a question, but just to add to what you're saying as a warning, um, who have taken um, for things like SIBO um, or just for some other milder um, health conditions than, than rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, 
they have taken some antimicrobial, antiparasitic uh, herbals and have had, consequently, symptoms of their rheumatoid arthritis come back. Okay. Um, and so um, I think that, that, that you know, your, your warning about how cautious you are about the treatment of the SIBO is, is very apt because um, I've had, as I said, some clients who were, were fairly freely taking these, uh, these herbal treatments and, and had a negative impact on their symptoms. So uh, just a word of caution there. Uh, mm. You want to be getting these kind of prescriptions from someone like yourself uh, rather than just buying them over the counter or, or taking them ca- uh, yeah, irrationally. Yeah, yeah definitely. And, and, mm. and I concur. I've certainly seen patients whose gut integrity has, has deteriorated from, from taking indiscriminate um, herbal antimicrobials. Yeah, they're powerful, yeah. aren't they? So the, these days with some of the concentration techniques we have, yeah, they are. You know, like the amount of oregano, for example, that goes into making a little drop of essential oil is actually quite substantial. And if you had to grow your your own oregano, distill it yourself, you would use it like gold because it takes. You'd, you'd realize how much you'd have to grow to get that small amount. And all of a sudden, yeah. now we've got these enteric-coated capsules with a tremendous amount of herbal components. And it's also a it's a a selective extract that only pulls out certain constituents. And I think I gave the other talk about this just a few weeks back at a. Um, her medicine conference was looking at okay because we've got lots of different ways of giving a herb from a powder to a tea to a decoction to a tincture to a tablet extract to a you know enteric coated essential oil type combo and that and that uh, when we only pull out the high notes we're we're sort of leaving behind lots of other compounds that may have balanced out that impact and we can we can see that like clove is a good example clove is a a herb that does have antimicrobial activity that's in the the volatile components so the essential oil components but it's also extremely potent in polyphenols, and polyphenols tend to have selectively nourishing effect, that they nourish sort of the more beneficial bugs in the gut, the anti-inflammatory ones, but can also be antimicrobial in their own right. So when you give it as a, as a tincture or just sort of ground up clove, you're actually getting the, the complete combination of compounds, where if it's just the essential oil, you're just getting these sort of the antimicrobial bits without the other notes alongside. And I think mm-hmm. there's greater potential of causing harm in that situation than if you're giving it as a tincture or as a powder, for example. And and I, I, I do enough pre and post testing with my patients to know that, that giving some of these same antimicrobial herbs as a tincture doesn't result in the same microbial um, ecosystem disruption as it does from taking the more concentrated tableted extract. Yeah, definitely. Gotcha. Let's talk about uh, the uh, where these bacteria live within the colon, if you don't mind. Um, my teachings around this in my presentations involve uh, what I have read in the in the literature, which is that our mucus on the epithelium uh, increases as we move throughout the small intestine and into the bowel, or should I say? It's a single layer, or it's there's a small amount of mucus in the small intestine, but there is a, a double layer and much thicker mucus inside the colon, and that that's where our bacteria live. And um, I'd like you to comment on that, and if that is indeed uh, what goes on. And also, um, I've got a theory that the drugs like prednisone, the steroids that are taken in some instances for some people with inflammatory arthritis, tend to deplete the mucus that exists on the bowel wall in the same way that that when asthma patients take um, steroid treatments as inhalers for their asthma, it gets rid of the mucus and helps them breathe better. I believe that those drugs also deplete the mucus um, on our intestinal wall, thereby reducing the available space and home for bacteria to live in. Okay. And, and furthermore, thereby making it hard for uh, nutrient uptake because as I have become, as I understand, uh, the mucosal lining is where a lot of our nutrient uptake occurs. So I'd just like your feedback on my understanding of these kind of concepts. I, I think in terms of the, the broader concept of, of mucosal thickness, et cetera, I think that's pretty spot on. And I think you're right that for the most part, bacteria are where they should be living <laughs> is, is in that mucus or on the outer side of that mucus, ideally. And there are some All species right. that tend to live a little bit more deeper in there. Awesome, but yeah. what, we, what we don't really want is a bacteria directly interacting with, with gut cells. That, and and that, this is something we see in inflammatory bowel disease like Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, is you often do have bacteria 
interacting directly with with gut epithelial cells. And and people are arguing that's part of the issue here mm. is that you have some of these species, and in, in, in those cases, it might be something like E. coli or Bacteroides that are interacting in a way that causes that sort of inflammation and causes that disrupted um, integrity in that local localized area. Um, it, there, there are certainly medications, and and I'm not sure about about prednisone specifically. Um, because I haven't specifically looked, and whether they've researched it's another another question. But there are meds that do damage the the mucosal layer, and I do have some caution around. I mean, obviously, there's times and places for for a whole wide range of medications where they they save lives and they they alter completely what's going on in a beneficial way in terms of quality of life and pain, etc. Um, so we have to keep that in mind too. But I, there are some cautions about meds that that do strip away that protective lining, with particularly with long term use, to in, in terms of potentially increasing risk of of a relapse of of certain certain conditions um, in that case, or certainly change in the ecosystem um, mm. composition as well. Because if you're altering that sort of thickness, or you're actually altering the amount of food that's available for for, for microbes, and that will result in a, a changed ecosystem. Yes. Okay. Um, you touched upon the crone situation where the bacteria are getting in contact with the uh, the epithelium um, and interacting with the the cells there of the gut wall. Uh, let's now talk about leaky gut. Um, just yep. the mechanisms behind it, where it occurs: small intestine, large intestine, or both. Yeah. Well, arguably both, but uh, but I would say that generally when we use the term leaky gut or increase in permeability, we're, we are talking about small. The small intestine, yeah, but I, but there, I'd say that there is certainly the case of, of large bowel leakiness, too. Right. So, so we need to keep that in mind. But generally, when we're talking about that, that's what we're referring to. Um, and what are the mechanics behind it? Um, if you could just give us a refresher, we've got some bacteria and food particles maybe passing through into our bloodstream. Yeah, yeah, because normally your your gut cells have this lovely intact barrier there. And it just lets in certain things in certain amounts, so it's much it's quite tightly regulated. But what can can happen is, if we take a medication like you know non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like ibuprofen or something like that, even continuously for a week or two is enough to to cause disruptions to to the gut integrity. Alcohol in you know more than four standard drinks is enough to cause you know gut gut leakiness. Um, as as more acute examples, and and certainly uh, an imbalance of, of of microbes in the gut can also result in increased gut permeability, and that can be through the production of I mentioned before hydrogen sulfide. Yeah. Hydrogen sulfide gas can cause increased gut leakiness, um, and another bacterial component called endotoxin or lipopolysaccharide that is found in in all gram negative bacteria, but but a, a very pro-inflammatory sort of endotoxins found in, in a group of bacteria called proteobacteria, um, which can be very much overgrown in, in many Westerners, for example. And that itself can cause damage to that gut. And, and that leads to, to a couple things. And you're right, that means that we can start absorbing food proteins that we wouldn't otherwise do, and food chemicals. And that can be things like cyclates and amines that weren't a problem before. And all of a sudden, your gut's leaky. These things get in, and all of a sudden, you start reacting to these to different foods, but also healthy foods that you didn't react to before. Um, but you're also getting bacterial compounds too, uh, like even more lipopolysaccharide. And lipopolysaccharide is very much a driver of, of body-wide inflammation that's now been implicated with you know, obesity, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, Alzheimer's disease, depression, anxiety. You know, and so essentially when the gut's leaky, we get more of that compound into the bloodstream. Your liver can deal with a bit of it. And then it can't, when it's constantly coming through, it can't deal with all of it. It reaches the sort of broader circulation, and then it causes inflammation. And they can manifest in different ways in different people. And that's where I think genes comes into the picture as well. But certainly it's very, very pro-inflammatory compound. So it's it's pretty common for my patients to to present um, with with a whole, when I'm treating people with anxiety, depression, um, through to, you know, also, Clytus and Crohn's and those more and celiac disease, where, where leaky guts are definitely part of what's going on, um, but also that dysbiotic environment where there's too much endotoxin in the gut lumen um, it, it, it is a common scenario in practice for for what range of conditions. Lipopolysaccharide is is that the uh, is that sorry I, I think you mentioned it, but just to clarify, is it a byproduct or a toxin or is it part of the bacteria itself? It's part of the bacteria. Just, so just like we grow, you know, fingernails and we grow hair, they grow this stuff called lipopolysaccharide. Um, so it's not like it's secreting this compound to make us ill, but it's just right. that it's composed of it. And when they die, that just releases that bit into your gut. And when your gut 
cells are really intact, only a tiny amount that gets through, and your liver will deal with it generally. But when you get your gut cells aren't so intact, you get increased permeability, um, and and or you have a much higher level of endotoxin containing bacteria in your gut, a lot more gets through. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned before um, in talking about the hydrogen sulfide gas producing bacteria, but also um, the butyrate producing bacteria. Yeah. Butyrate is a uh, a product that is produced by um, bacteria also, uh, yeah. and we we want a lot of that, don't we? Can you speak about that for us? We sure do. We sure do. And, and this it's one of the most marvelous substances that bacteria produce for us. It, it's we're we're so dependent upon it that our our colon cells, our large intestinal cells, are reliant on it as a food source. Like we've evolved this complete reliance on bacterial creation of butyrate because that makes up about seventy percent of their energy needs are met wow. from this. And if we don't produce enough, our colon cells don't get fed. <laughs> Essentially, that, wow. that's a big issue. And there are people arguing that this is a, a, a certainly a driver for a lot of Western diseases where people tend not to feed their butyrate-producing bacteria very well on a standard mm-hmm. Western diet. Um, but certainly cases like ulcerative colitis as well, which, which we see being, being yep. associated with a Western diet and lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so butyrate is, is, as I alluded to, the main f- food source or fuel source for your, your colonocyte, large bowel cells. Um, and then when we produce more than they can use, then yeah. it goes into your, your circulation. And this is the most amazing thing because once it's in your circulation, it has a body-wide anti-inflammatory effect. Awesome. It heals, heals up like a damaged blood-brain barrier. It actually changes how neurotransmitters are, are created in your brain because it decreases inflammation there. Um, it improves uh, blood sugar control and insulin sensitivity. You know, it, it's, a, it's an amazing substance. The more research we do on it, the more amazing we actually find it is. And here we've got these little factories in our gut happy to make it for us if we feed them. <laughs> and this is the, the issue because a lot of people aren't feeding these species. And that means that our gut cells don't even have enough, let alone our whole body has enough of this substance that we've evolved with and we are reliant on for physiological activity. Okay. So the million dollar question then is how do we feed them? Um, and if that's really beneficial for our large intestine, um, are these butyrate producing bacteria also helping the leaky gut scenario in our small intestine? Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 And this is a cool thing too. And is when we actually increase butyrate production in the colon, we actually speed up healing and regeneration in the small intestine too. So for me, this is a big part mm. of my, like, you know, leaky gut treatment is looking at, yeah, I, I look at, I might supplement some glutamine and other things that are the, the main food source for the small intestinal cells, but I have to nourish the butyrate producing bacteria, because if they can increase their, their production of butyrate, it's going to heal up the entire small and large bowel. It's amazing, Sorry. isn't it? I mean, I yeah. can see why you're passionate about it. I, I, I don't quite get goosebumps because we haven't really touched upon like something that's, um, you know, a, a, a life changing example where it, it's very emotional, but it's intellectually exciting, this stuff. <laughs> I share that. <laughs> and when I read more papers about butyrate, as I said, I get even more passionate about it. And yeah. and, and this it, it's doing lots of stool assessments with microbiota assessments with patients. Like, you know, some patients have got ten percent butyrate producing bacteria, other people sixty percent. Sixteen you know? or sixty. 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 So they can have six, six times as much wow. butyrate producing bacteria in their gut. You know, and that obviously flows on in terms of what consequences there there is. Because if you only have ten percent of what's there, it means you're not feeding them well. They're not producing much butyrate, and there's going to be flow on consequences from that, which we're seeing all around us in terms of the conditions associated with with uh, you know uh, metabolic dysfunction. Mm. I think are very much related to this this mm. area. So, how do we feed up our our, micro, our butyrate producing bacteria in our microbiota? It's really soluble fibers and resistant starches are probably the core aspects of things yeah so um you know fiber more more broadly having as a wide variety of fiber fiber as possible i think is certainly one of the the recommendations i I do give to my patients across the board but it's soluble fibers and resistant starches that are perhaps the biggest drivers of beet rate production um so can you give us examples obviously we're all uh pretty across this being on a plant-based diet with most people who are following uh my program yeah um so soluble fiber, yes, but I would like you just to talk about fiber a little bit more uh, in some basic terms and give us the differences. And then some examples of um, some res- resistant starches as well. Okay. So we can start with resistant starch. Okay. Um, you'll, you'll find that the resistant starches are, are widely found in um, whole grains, 
and legumes and 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 root vegetables as well to give you an idea as well as some things like unripe bananas might be one of the these sort of um you know fruit selections that you can consume it's made it all that pleasant but you can take you know powdered green banana flour these days as a way of trying to get resistant starch in without the unpleasantness of eating the unripe banana itself mm-hmm. um Yes, but I think it's those two groups that are that are, are sometimes avoided by people that are actually trying to look after their gut and trying to do the right yeah. thing, mm. but inadvertently end up starving off their butyrate producing bacteria because they're not feeding them. Um, and so we find that particularly bigger chunks of grain rather than finely milled, and obviously whole grains rather than, than mm-hmm. refined white, um, will have more resistant starch. We'll also find that if it's heated and cooled, so if we have cook some, I might cook some black and brown rice. Black, yeah brown and red rice actually i might cook for dinner and then i'll eat it cold the next day as, as part of a salad and it's wow. going to have more resistant starch when it's cold okay so the, the starch changes shape when it's cooked and it changes shape again and this is called retrograde starch and then it's resistant to our digestive enzymes reaches the colon where it feeds the microbes that produce butyrate sometimes i have a list listeners who take things very literally for example we had a a guest who uh, wrote a book called The Symbiont Factor, uh, Dr. Richard Matthews, who's in the United States, who's uh, got a great deal of knowledge around the similar uh, uh, topic that we're talking about today. And he yep. talked about uh, fermenting his oats. And I still get questions all the time about how do I ferment my oats because he talked about fermenting my oats. And so just to, just to, to kind of get ahead of the game here, yeah. Should we be waiting on our food or should we occasionally be allowing some of our uh, uh, cooked foods to, to cool down and eat the next day? Or is the level of improvement only small in terms of its butyrate potential? I would say it's pretty marked, actually. So, wow. so I certainly recommend that patients do this with uh, pasta. It's the same if you're using like a you know whole grain, whole grain. gluten-free sort of pasta. The next day it's going to have more resistant starch and, and legumes. It's the same scenario as well as as um, you know chunky chunky grains like rice, which or, or probably would be a similar with with quinoa. But I don't think there's quite as much in quinoa. But but rice is certainly a good example. Wow. Okay, that. so you say whack it on a salad the next day and you're in business for your lunch. Yeah, yeah. So so I might have like a you know vegetable stir fry one night and then mm-hmm. the next day I would have I just add lots of leafy greens and some. You know, slice up tomato and cucumber, et cetera, to make that rice in a salad dressing, to make that a rice salad and have the, the next day in that way, I'm getting that resistant starch. Fantastic. Uh, and, yeah. and in terms of uh, quantity of resistant starch, are the, the green bananas or the powdered green banana, so yeah, the, the green banana powder, uh, are we going to have as much impact if we try and go down that path, if we put the green bananas in smoothies or something, or is the biggest impact going to come from uh, um, just eating our whole grains and and so forth and having legumes yeah. yeah i mean i think that's the best way of doing it yeah and and i think it's i'm quite fine with blending up some green banana into your smoothie too i prefer mm. the 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 right using food as a basis yeah. when i when i can and that that's not to say i don't use prebiotic supplements because i do <laughs> and frequently yeah. when i'm trying to shift that ecosystem very quickly yeah. to a healthier state and trying to revive species that are at the edge of extinction i totally use prebiotics in that case as, as supplemental powders as well as they're doing the dietary mm. work, but we're trying to maintain it, that healthy ecosystem with the dietary work long okay. term. Okay, yeah. love it. And then um, soluble fiber versus insoluble fiber. Little lesson yeah, for us there. Yeah. And some people are wanting to toss out this concept because I'm not sure how, you know, <laughs> but essentially soluble fiber means it mixes with water versus insoluble fiber, it doesn't. That's that's really where, where the term comes from. But we know that those, those fibers that do sort of mix in with water that are more viscous tend to be fermented better, whereas cellulose would be an insoluble fiber, uh, at least in, in Westerners these days, isn't widely fermented. It's a little bit, but not that much. Now, if we gave a, a bowl of cellulose to some a rural you know, African tribe that that hasn't had antibiotics and C-sections and eaten a fiber, fiber diet for their, all their entire existence, they, they, they can still have their cellulose degrading bacteria. So they'll still get some some nutrients out of that uh, or some you know clonic energy out of that, whereas we don't so much. Yeah, but soluble fiber generally is fermented well, and that's why it's feeding some of the butyrate producing bacteria. So the soluble fiber that we find in legumes, tofu tempeh, for example, would be, be clear examples of the f- type that's been shown to increase butyrate production. In the colon. It's interesting you mentioned legumes both in the soluble fiber category and also in the resistant starch category. Yep. Is there therefore very little surprise that legumes are the sort of the blue zones hero of longevity? 
it's not that surprising when you're looking at that from a gut perspective. I know people, and this always blows my mind, that the, the vehemence against legumes in certain parts of the blogosphere <laughs> currently. But when you're looking back and going, these things have got polyphenols. So they're often like you know black black beans, and, and they've got the beautiful red color for zuki beans, for example. And polyphenols feed our gut, gut, good gut bacteria. They contain resistant starches. They contain soluble fibers, and they contain oligosaccharides, which feed our beneficial bacteria. So they might contain four or five different compounds that are nourishing the, the sort of beneficial anti-inflammatory bacteria in our gut. Yeah, so no, I'm not surprised that yeah. that's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, is there any common mistakes with, for example, legumes that people make when they eat them? Is there a problem, for example, because they're high in protein to combine them with, their, with uh, another food source that doesn't get digested well as a combination. Like, I guess my question is, if people have beans and rice or if they have, uh, say, lentils and rice in a yellow dal or something, are we talking about a really healthy meal there or are we making some kind of mistake? Really healthy meal. <laughs> <laughs> I would say I, I don't think that we have to be strict about separating out proteins and starches, etc. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very small proportion of people that it makes any difference to their quality of life. Yeah. Um, yeah, so no, I think those are lovely. You know, so far I have my Mexican beans with you know lots of black beans, lots of onions and garlic in there, and then I have that on my my black and brown rice combo. It's like you know I'm nourishing my micro microbiota in numerous ways with a meal like that. Mm. You mentioned garlic and onion, all good. Very yeah, good. Yeah. yeah, because they they contain oligosaccharides and. Uh, they can be called uh, inulin or fruit oligosaccharides, or in some terminology they call fruit fructans mm -hmm. and galactans for the other sort of, of oligosaccharides we find in legumes, for example, or galacto oligosaccharides. Yeah. So I, I think the biggest issue people have is when you're not used to eating them, you start eating them, you produce more gas. Yeah. And if your gut is working the way it should, you just fart more. All right. That's no it. Problem. No problem. But, and, and then that usually peaks out by day seven or 10. Now, the yeah. problem comes is if you have SIBO, for example, then it, yeah. you, you, you get more gas, you get more pain, discomfort, bloating, distension. It's not very pleasant. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you have very slow transit time in that year, what I would see, I mean, some patients I have, if they eat something and it comes out 16 hours later. Other patients, it's 10 days later before it comes out. Right. And you think of how much gas gets built up wow. and how little of it gets expelled if it takes 10 days for stuff to move across. So you introduce legumes into that situation. It's just, they, again, might blow and distend rather than just getting more farting. So sometimes you have to do some preliminary work to make the gut um, capable of dealing with the increased gas production in, in people whose guts are very damaged. Because you know they're going to be very much part of the process to keep them in good shape and to heal the gut, but they're going to cause symptoms in the, in the short here and now. So we would often, if it's on with SIBO, we deal with the SIBO first. And then they often have clonic inflammation that we have to decrease first that makes their gut um, hypersensitive to, to intestinal gas due to the level of inflammation that's present in the gut. Mm -hmm. So those are sometimes pre-work we have to do before they can introduce more legumes. And when we, when we do, it's See. like a take a tablespoon every second day wow. <laughs> for a few weeks yep. and try to open it up. The, the mistake you can also make is just eating a huge bowl at once a week. Um, you're not, your gut's not going to adapt so well as if you eat a relatively small amount every couple of days and then slowly work work your way up. But it, but if you're one of those people that just gets more gassy and more farts more with legumes, yeah. then that you can you can go in pretty quickly and just know that your system will will adapt quite readily over a period of a week to two weeks. Yeah. I love that really, really slow reintroduction concept and uh, uh, something that I recommend as well. I'm just very pleased to hear that that's also something that you find works for your patients. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah. these days I'm seeing some very un people with very, very inflamed mm. guts compared to where mm. I was at five or ten years ago. So wow. we have to go very slow with with that. And and strangely enough, it's not always like I often find in conditions like ulcerative colitis, people can go straight on mm. on on legumes and and um, you know the sort of coating cooled um, right. whole grains, for example, and it's totally yeah. fine. Yeah. But then I've got patients with irritable bowel syndrome and, yeah. and SIBO. Um, where where it's actually really slow going, um, and, and even if the, when the SIBO is treated, we often will have to do you know six months of colonic work before they can introduce much in the way of legumes. Right. Okay. Um, I uh, I know we're we're sort of at our time here, but uh, if you didn't just indulge me just for another few minutes, if that would be okay. Yeah. Um, vegetable oils. Uh, I have a particular passion against them um, for their pro-inflammatory effect. 
Um, the literature seems to be a little bit in two camps about this. One is it's the high in omega-6 fatty acids, which is the inflammation um, pathway that gets triggered. Yep. Another is that uh, I have a lot of studies that I've pulled together that shows that um, fat in general, high fat um, tends to increase intestinal permeability. Yeah. Could I get you to give me your, your views on this? Uh, which one is it or is it both? Yeah, I've come across those studies to to Clint that link the high fat diet with with increased gut permeability, and it's as we we know the current current vogue is is high fat. So those studies are being you know, stuffed down, so that we can actually see them and not talked about much. So um, it's nice to have someone else actually bring them up. Um, so I think it's a bit of both that they have certainly the the omega six content. You know, is is certainly the precursor of arachidonic acid, which is a pro-inflammatory compound. That our body produces under you know some sort of stressful scenario, so having less of that in the system is obviously good. But I do think there's the potential of um, just the higher fat content, particularly I think for me it's where it's isolated away from whole foods. So mm -hmm. um, I've got less issues with people eating you know olives, and nuts, and eating avocados. No no concerns there. But I do have concerns with people just dumping tablespoons of coconut oil on their their, their foods, for example, or heaps ghee or butter or lard on yeah. their foods. I've got far more concerns around that. And there's 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 a, a whole bunch of data around the impact of um, saturated fat in particular, <clears throat> facilitating the absorption of endotoxins that we talked about before. And the saturated fats, whether they be from dairy or even from coconut, seem to be able to bind to lipopolysaccharides or endotoxin and facilitate their absorption into the bloodstream wow. um, in, a, in a way that, that olive oil didn't, for example, or fish oil didn't. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I'd love to see that study as well. I'd include that one in my, my okay. stuff. That, that's cool. That's cool. Cause I'm always looking at ways to just to justify the, um, the, the effects that we see in practice, which is that okay. if someone goes and, uh, and eats a bowl of hot chips, I mean, it's game over tomorrow. It is yeah. game over. Okay. Um, and it's not the potatoes, it's the oil that they were cooked in. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I just want to, uh, wrap up with, um, some quick questions for you, just uh, so these commonly, frequently asked questions that we get, and uh, and sort of just some brief answers from yourself. Um, I'll do my best, but brevity is not always my strong point. Oh, look, <laughs> look, the the uh, the time restraints only to respect your time. So if you okay. if you're happy to give us longer answers, that's wonderful for us. Um, I don't think there's anyone watching or listening right now saying, "Oh, come on, wrap this up." <laughs> <laughs> okay, good to hear. Yeah. Um, can uh, fermented foods, you mentioned sauerkraut, pickles, and so on. Um, two questions around them. Uh, are they hel healthful for us to eat? Uh, and do they provide us with um, potentially uh, bacteria that can become uh, part of our own ecosystem? Um, and is the salt an issue in, the, in them? Do, do you think the salt has an impact on our, on our health negatively? Ah, interesting, that last, last point. I mean, I think it would depend on, on how much salt was used because I've been I've made I've been a fermenter for nearly yeah, about 20 years actually so I, I do think that um I've often made very low salt varieties with just a pinch of salt for like a big big vat so I don't always think salt is, is hugely essential it depends on the, the techniques you're using and etc mm. um it, it just happens to be that lactobacilli that are the main you know organs the left in, in most of these traditional ferments handle high salt and a lot of competing bugs don't so you're selectively creating environment that that or you're creating an environment that selectively benefits lactobacilli because they can tolerate it and oh, competing bugs don't. So that's part of the reason why, as well as just the food processing aspect that salt pulls the moisture out. So when you're just chopping cabbage by hand, yeah. then the salt will do that additional job of, of pulling some of the moisture out. Whereas for me, I would use a one of those those twin gear juicers when I used to make my, my vegetable ferments, and that would pull the juice and fiber, separate it out, and then you put it back together, and you wouldn't need much salt added to that. Um, it would because there's nothing you do you pull out. You don't need to pull out the water, and there's always enough native lactobacilli to dominate the ecosystem anyway, because it always sour quite beautifully. So I've made so many low salt ferments that I think it, it's not always essential. Um, so just take keep that in mind, I suppose, with with ones that you buy and how much salt might be added to that. Because right. lots that I have that are not hugely salty, okay. and I've had others that are yeah add way too much salt. I'm like, yeah. oh, even a teaspoon of this seems like it's way too much. Whereas others, I can eat half a cup and doesn't taste that salty at all um so there's that and i think we, we touched on on this concept before about mm. being able to colonize your gut with bacteria from fermented foods and it just doesn't happen and, right. and that doesn't mean that you right. should eat them and enjoy them i had lovely 
bits of um, kimchi on my um, breakfast this morning, for example. And it wasn't because the kimchi bugs wouldn't live in my gut forever after. It yeah. wasn't why, because I liked the taste mostly more than anything else. <laughs> but you also get that low glycemic index when you actually have the um, something to do with the lactic acid and acetic acid we tend oh. to find in these ferments actually lower the glycemic loading of that meal. So your blood sugar will stay far more stable after you eat a fermented food like that or add that to your normal meal, for example. It also has a range of gut healing compounds called polyamines in sauerkraut and, um, and kimchi that speed up sort of healing and regeneration of, of damaged stomach cells and small intestinal cells. So another reason why, um, and potentially antifungal compounds too, because the main competition for that sort of nutrient in that ferment vessel is often yeast and molds. So the lactobacilli um, will often pr produce some sort of antifungal compound to to keep them at bay, essentially. So we might be getting small amounts of this, <clears throat> which you could argue would have a, a beneficial effect on, on your gut, just keeping perhaps. Although I, I should point out that we know so little about the microbiome in terms of what's healthy, what's not, when looking at the fungal components of that ecosystem. But, but I think the trace amounts we find in there are probably not I've always considered it beneficial anyway. Mm. Okay. Fascinating. Okay. Thank you. Um, shelf stable uh, probiotics are now really popular um, yep. versus the um, more sort of original style, which is everything needed to be refrigerated. Uh, I've, I've, I've come to understand that it's just the technology that's used and the manufacturer guarantees the numbers on the bottle uh, to write till the expiration date. Uh, do you have any, um, well, I'm sure you do. What, what's, what's the, what's the, uh, the official take on the shelf stable versus refrigerated. Yeah, and it, it very much depends on the on the strain of bacteria that that were used. And I mentioned that obstacle course with probiotics that that was used. And one of the obstacles or hurdles they have to jump is shelf stability at room temperature. So mm -hmm. newer ones often will take the boxes because they, they were, were chosen to, to be developed into a commercial product because it has shelf oh, stability. Right, which isn't yeah. the best motivator. Well, typically, yeah, well, it's usually not the only one, thankfully. So, so these days they would look at gastric acid stability, yep. bile salt stability, whether it adheres temporarily, how it adheres, whether it produces a compound that is selectively antimicrobial to kill off potential pathogens or pathobionts, but leave the good guys intact, mm -hmm. um, and shelf stability. Those would be sort of like the basic criteria, and and it's safe when ingested. So those would be the basic criteria. So they tick those boxes, and it's like okay. Um, so what companies will often do is from, take that strain, do some animal research with it, then do human trials with it, and they go from that you know isolation through to a finished finished product. And in which case, we know it's shelf stable, and we know it may well have therapeutic effects beyond just taking up car spots in the gut, yeah. but it actually may may you know be useful for. Um, oh, well, we can look at a strain called Bifidobacterium lactis HN019 that speeds up colon transit time. Significantly, so this is one that's very good for people with slow gut transit time or constipation. You know, so that's an additional attribute it has besides just ticking all those those basic mm. boxes. It actually has therapeutic effects, and I think for me, this is one of the key things about probiotics: is you choose the one that displays the action or characteristic that you want to take, or you, the physiology you want to change. So mm. if I've got someone with slow gut transit time, I can give the strain that speeds that up. If I have someone with with damaged small intestines or increased permeability, I can give the strain that can speed can speed up healing of that. Yeah, it's. If I have great. someone with with Helicobacter pylori causing stomach ulcers, I can give a strain that helps reduce levels of Helicobacter pylori. And not all strains do, but some certainly do. So it's really trying to match what what you're trying to do with the strain that has the action at hand. And this this is what. 40 years of probiotic research has really told us and the best way of using probiotics is very in a targeted way rather than just throw let's throw mm -hmm. 150 billion cfu of 10 different strains at something and mm -hmm. with another strain shown to do anything mm -hmm. um I, I think that's a, a poor way of using probiotics and you'll get poor results mm -hmm. comparatively mm -hmm. then if you use them selectively going okay well this strain has got the exact actions that i'm after I'll give it to you in the dose that's got human clinical trials showing it works. And you mm -hmm. know what? It usually works rather than guessing and experimenting mm -hmm. with, with unknown agents, essentially. Which which really explains why your clinic is doing so well, because this is hard to do as a patient if you really, uh, you know, first of all, working out what your actual situation is. And second of all, knowing how on earth you can then know what, what bacterial strain is suitable to helping that? And then no. the, how on earth are you going to find it? I mean, you go to your, your local, you know, Whole Foods in the US or a health food store here and say, hey, I want this strain and someone's going to look at you blankly. So 
Sadly, yes. <laughs> that, and that's why I developed some online some tools to try to make this easier because for that exact scenario. So oh, if you look at look at something like rheumatoid arthritis, like the, yeah. I think the strain with, with a, a positive study was uh, Bacillus coagulans GBI 306086, which is a really catchy name and easy to memorize. Mm-hmm. Not. Um, and and it's been shown to help reduce pain levels in patients with rheumatoid mm-hmm. arthritis, for example. Mm-hmm. Yet there are other strains that uh, there's a combination of lactose rhamnosis GR1 and lactobacillus fermentum RC14, given to RA patients, didn't improve things at all. Right. So I think it, 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 RA, like any other condition, is, is you, there's strains that, that, that to date have shown efficacy and there's strains that have shown not to be useful. And there's a whole bunch of strains that have never been researched and we have no idea what they do. Yeah. So I, for me, would generally go with the ones that have clinical trials showing that they're, they're helpful. And, and the challenge is as a, as a patient is going through the literature and working out yeah, what strain it is and where to find it. And then this is also a challenge for practitioners too. I should sure. point out because yeah. it's yeah, um, very multitude of products on the market that it can be hard to take the time to adequately assess before prescribing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, when should we take our probiotics? I've read on an empty stomach and I've read uh, right before meals and interestingly, right before meals that happen to have uh, uh, somewhat of a fat content in them. So, um, yeah, I think the, the data is pretty clear that we get better survival with meals, with, so with the right after. Yeah, yeah. With your right stomach after. acidity, your stomach acidity is far stronger. It's more acid on an empty stomach. Wow. People forget this that the pH might be two, two and a half. Yeah. Uh, when it's it's designed just to kill any microbes that go in there, mm-hmm. and that's what you're doing. If you just take your probiotic on an empty stomach, very strong acidity. Um, and <laughs> Suicide missions have, straight yeah, in. Yeah, exactly. It, whereas when you're, your pH, when you're having a big meal, you're looking at three and a half, four, or four and a half, and it, you have much better survival at that pH range, which is closer towards, it's not neutral, but it's more in that area than a much more acidic pH. So data is very clear. And, and, uh, and data has shown that that... Um, a bigger a bigger meal in terms of like I would say carbohydrate content is probably a like whole, whole grainy sort of thing or legumes would actually enhance survival and there's certainly research on dairy enhancing survival too and something about its capacity to buffer the pH in the stomach that means you can give a lot less bacteria in a dairy dairy form than you could in a capsule to get the same number of bacteria in the colon. I keep thinking of more questions. <laughs> Sorry, um, but it, I, I guess um, well, well the comment on that is is. You know, it doesn't. It, it always seems to come back to common sense. I mean, if the body's not eating anything, then the body would think, well, at the moment I'm walking around and I'm just, you know, I'm I'm outside. I'm I'm doing whatever I've been doing, uh, uh, you know, from a evolutionary point of view for thousands of years, millions of years. Um, it's not likely that I right now want to take in a whole bunch of bacteria, right? It just doesn't make sense. Um, but then when I'm eating my food, again, if we look at more primitive kind of ways of eating, we probably got some bacteria from the soil. We probably picked up, you know, bacteria from the plants that we're eating that aren't washed and so forth. And most um, likely fecal fecal exposure. <laughs> from, <laughs> right, because we haven't washed our hands. fertilized plants and, yeah, we didn't wash our hands and we're, yeah. we're drinking the water downstream from people that are upstream. Maybe right, wash right, their hands right. or wash exactly. their bottoms in that stream, you know. So I think, yeah, yeah there's yeah. that aspect so it does make sense. Uh, and do you think that as the food moves through the through the digest, digestive tract with that bacteria, that that bacteria begins to immediately start to consume some of those resistant starches and some of that fiber on its I way? Would, and I actually, would suggest that would be the case too, yeah. is that you're actually providing some food food yeah. for it too. And that's some of that's obviously going to be digested in the small small bowel, for yeah. example, and absorbed. But this could still, yeah. even with, with a dose of, of like glucose, which is a well-absorbed sugar, a trace amount will always be malabsorbed in everybody, for example, or mm-hmm. sucrose. So mm-hmm. um, in that case, if there's any bacteria with that, they would have a little bit of food source to go along. Mm-hmm. So yes, I think that's another way of looking at it, that you're providing a bit of a food package with, with yeah. your little drop off of bugs. I get this get childish image of like these bugs as they're going, moving down the, like a slippery slide through the intestine, just feeding as they go, you know, eating the way down. Yeah. Um, um, can we overdose on probiotics? I think based on current data, we'd say that they're an immensely safe class of agent, really. Mm-hmm. Like the reviewing some of the data for a textbook chapter I did recently, it was like, you know, there's uh, looking at that, at all the studies today looking at kids, the placebo had more side effects than the probiotic. <laughs> Right, did right. you know? So I'd say for the vast, yeah. vast majority of of people, probiotics are safe, and and in the you know the range that we would typically use from a clinical trial perspective is between 100 million bacteria up to probably 450 billion. So giving way above that amount, well, 
you know, we don't know, I suppose, arguably, because we haven't done the research on it and, and mm. certainly beyond what we would find in traditional fermented foods. So there might be a point at which there is a problem because we just don't have data. But certainly up to that point, mm. they're, they're immensely safe in the vast majority of people. And it doesn't mean that there aren't the occasional person that you have to be more careful with, definitely, mm. um, and be more selective with what probiotic you use, definitely. But I think in general, they're very safe class of agents. Mm. Um, I now want to close by finding out uh, how people can contact you and so forth. Before we do that, is that do you think that there's something we've overlooked? Is there is there something that you you find is um, really important to convey in these interviews you've done with other people or in your live uh, presentations? When I think we've covered most of, of the important aspects, I believe, and that you're, you're always limited by time, yeah, <laughs> regardless. Exactly. But yeah. I think just love your microbes, nourish those microbes, because you know I think that greater understanding that's coming out is that that we're not just a human body with microbes there; that we actually are a super organism that is composed of human cells and microbe cells, and that makes you you. Um, and I think so far we've put a lot of effort into killing and causing, inadvertently causing damage to our our, our, our microbe components of ourself um, over the last you know 50, 60 years from from interventionist perspective through to um, through the medical interventions we, we are using and also the diet that we're choosing to eat. And I think we just need to be more aware that that we are part microbe and we need to look, nurture and look after those components of ourself if we want to be optimally healthy. Yeah, hear, hear. Okay, um, your clinic, what you do, um, I know you're very much in demand and uh, it's uh, it's taken us a little while to, to find this time slot for yourself. Um, how can people contact your clinic or even yourself do you do you work with clinic uh, with people who are international i know you're based in australia and we've got a, a very wide worldwide audience um people are going to be interested to to talk to you and to learn more what should they do a, a couple of things I, mean, I do offer some online courses which were around microbiota meet your microbiome for the sort of healthy con health conscious general public which is designed mm -hmm. to introduce you to your microbes and and get you to love them <laughs> and get you yeah. to, to learn the skills of looking after it so i've got some online courses that you might might find va valuable adjuncts to, to everything else that you're doing i think that's one thing and and i do and that's at, at probioticadvisor.com that's my website and we do have a whole uh, a database around evidence-based prescribing of, of probiotics. Um, that is a, a subscription service mostly designed for clinicians, but we have 24-hour free access if you just want to have a look and play around a bit for that, that time point. And if you take a lot of probiotics, you might well find the, the you know, forty nine ninety five sort of annual fee to be quite quite yeah, fine to sure. help guide your decision making in the area. Yeah. Um, yeah, but we do have a range of courses too that, that that could be useful. And then my my clinical practice is at Gould's Natural Medicine, which is an old um, natural medicine apothecary in Hobart that dates back to eighteen eighty one. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so I practice out of out of there a couple of days a week as well. Okay, all right. Well, thank you so much. Um, this has just been fascinating, and as you said, we're always limited by time. And I wish this were a five hour plane plane ride, but uh, <laughs> yep. but we're going to have to let you get back to doing the great work that you do. So thank you so much for sharing everything you've you've done uh, with us today. Everything you've talked about, uh, I've learned a lot, and um, I'm really stoked that uh, we've been able to have you on the show and be able to share this knowledge with everyone. Oh, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invite, Clint. <laughs>